Thank you. So, uh, as you may be noticing, this is going to be a slightly unconventional talk with a lot of audience participation. I need one more volunteer to randomly distribute these books throughout the audience. Anybody? You ran Anybody? out of pens. Huh? Uh, and just go with pens, as much pens, as you can. Two pens or one pen? Hmm? Two pens or one pen? One of each color as long as you can, and then whatever you can. Okay. Thank you, Connor. Yeah. And everybody should be getting writing implements and a little trifold thingy. So, one of the lovely things about being a speaker is you have effectively a captive audience that you can do things like make them work for you for the 40 minutes while you're giving a talk. So that's what we're going to be doing today. And okay. So you've all read the talk title, and there's going to be a little bit of scattered chaos for the rest of our time together. Uh, feel free to interrupt me at any point, and feel free to play for the word scribble on. There's actually in your little brochure there's a space for you to take notes somewhere on the inside if you want to. And what we're going to be talking about fits a lot of the other uh, things that other speakers here have talked about today. So, for instance, Mad Dog yesterday talked about why would you want to get students involved in open source projects. Anyhow, Leslie talked about individual contributors. David talked about some of the pitfalls of uh, professors getting involved. Amos and Walter pointed out that this is not just sort of a grown-up thing. You can get them streamed in from a very young age, very beginning level. And so what I want to do here to wrap up the education track is, all right, how do we actually do that last point? How do we translate completely chaotic open source environments into something that can be used within the structured environment of the classroom so that teachers have some sort of confidence that it's not going to blow up at the end? And so what we're going to do is we're actually going to do that. I've got a bunch of artifacts from open source projects here. You all have writing implements, and we are going to mark them up and grade the heck out of them, and then we will post the resulting work on the internet. And one of the places they're going to be used is several of the previous speakers mentioned Posse, which is a professor's open source software or somewhere, depending on which one you want to use, experience. And that's a workshop we do for faculty that are trying to get their students in their classes involved in open source. And we're going to be taking those artifacts to professors and using it as part of the materials that they go over this summer when they think about how to incorporate it into their assignments and their teaching in their classroom. So originally, what we were going to do was that I would throw all these artifacts up on the screen, and then everyone would have like mobile phones or laptops or whatnot, and we would all go collaborative editing and have a microblogging theme on the side and make commentary as we went along, and then I discovered that this building is a giant Faraday cage. So, I went and killed a bunch of trees. Um, but as a side bonus, you got stickers including the uh, nice work, the number one student, and the way to go sticker, and on smiley faces and apples. So, um, the last thing I'm going to need the audience to do is shuffle around before I actually launch into the very short introductory portion before I make you all do labor for me, is uh, I need you folks to earn yourselves into teams. So, let's, do, uh, let's, let's see if I can do this. Uh, how many people here are educators, teachers of some sort at any level? Okay. Um, let's see. I need four teams, so can every educator with their hand up find another pair? So we'll have one, two, three, four. Keep, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Why don't you two in the front pull up, you two pull up, you two in the back pull up, and I'll go with you. So, go for each other. And, and um, so, one group here, one group there, one group in the back, one group in the back there. Did you want the educators to pair up with the educators uh, or with not? So, each group will have either one or two educators and then a bunch of other people. Okay. All right, so educators, raise your hands again. All right, so we've got, uh, so group one, two in the back, three, and uh, the two of you together are uh, four. So let's, 
uh, and go to the one that's geographically closest to you. So get up, move. Go to go go to your go to your teacher. I'm going to randomly hand out things with stickers to people. And whoever is watching the video hates me right now because I'm moving off camera. Uh, and you're in the back. Okay. Right here, right here. Oh, but you, do we seem to have five groups? Can the educators raise your hand one more time? Okay, one, two, three. So you, you come up here with this group. We need a couple more non-teachers to join this group. We still don't have any paper. <laughs> yep. And each group should have one and only one packet. So if your group has more than one packet, give me the other one. Okay, zero. Can you hand me that? Yeah. <coughs> there you go. All right. Okay. So. Is anybody not in a group? Raise your hand if you're not in a group. Everybody is in a group. Okay. And each of these groups has packets. And as I'm talking, feel free to ignore me. Start handing out these things to people, scribbling on them. Uh, it is deliberate that there is too much material in these packets to understand all at once. And it is also deliberate that there is no further contact given than the things you have been handed. So this is supposed to be confusing because one of the mentalities we have in open source projects is uh, David Humphrey of Seneca College calls it being productively lost. And that is sort of the mindset you want to be in where you're not quite sure what's going on, but you're sort of moving forward and trying to be useful and productive anyway. So. Here's what we're going to do. Um, each group should have a packet, each group should have a variety of writing implements, and in a moment I'm going to give you some instructions for scribbling things out, and our very volunteer Kevin over here is going to come up and show an example of what we did together this morning to give you some sort of illustration of how you might be thinking. But first, I want to explain a bit about what exactly we're doing, why we're doing this. So, who here has one of those foreign language books I brought in? Uh, yeah. All right, cool. How many people here have ever been to another country? Vacation, study abroad, okay. Uh, another country where the language spoken there was not the language that you usually speak at home. Okay, how many people were confused when they got off the plane? Why, why, would, you, why would you go there anyway? Where did you go? I went to Jamaica. You went to Jamaica? Why do you go to Jamaica? To get married. <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> for, the, for the scenery, to meet people, learn, learn, learn about the people. Yeah. All right, who else? Who else has been somewhere? Where'd you go? France. What for? Um, just to visit. Okay. So we go to foreign places to do the same kind of things in some cases that we could do at home. Like in college, I had a lot of friends that went abroad to Japan, to Australia, New Zealand, to take the same engineering classes they could have taken in Boston. Now, why would they do that? The same content. Right? Because it's the stuff that goes beyond the content. It's the cultural experience, it's the immersion. And there are all those things that are not differential equations you have to learn to be able to successfully study abroad in France. Uh, I went to China last summer. I needed to get to my hotel and get dinner. And this seems like a very simple thing to do. Right? And for someone who actually speaks Chinese, which I don't really, it's a very simple thing to do. But in order to do that, I had to look up the word for haircut, figure out the word for subway, figure out the word, can you please take me to the subway station, and how to count the money for the taxi. I do a little tiny cultural thing. And so what I'm suggesting here is, the way we want to look at open source experiences, especially in terms of incorporating them in the schools, is similar to a study abroad thing. It's a cultural immersion. And the point is not to learn math or to learn C++, because there are many other ways you can do that. 
You do it because this is a way you want to expose students to that kind of richness, that kind of culture. And because it is a cultural immersion, you need to prepare them to swim in this strange world and language they may not understand. Not by preventing them from accessing the real world stuff. Because if you go to France and all you do is sit in classrooms with other expats, you're not learning very much. But to find ways to get them out with guidebooks, phrasebooks, dictionaries, uh, people who are holding books, like, can you wave them around and tell people what it is you have in your hand? What do you have? Chinese. Chinese. Oh, Getting around in Chinese. Get around in Chinese. Okay. Uh, what do you have? American language dictionary. American Sign Language Dictionary. Who else has something? Tifuna. What is that? Right in the back. Not sure. It's something in Spanish. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's I'm mispronouncing because I don't speak Spanish. In Spanish. Translation. What do you have in the back there? Poems. Translated Chinese poems. I know someone has this little tourist guide to New York City. Yes, you have a tourist guide to New York City. And in the back, there are German for dummies. And I think there might be other things floating about. Yeah. There is, yeah, what, what do you have? Chinese. Chinese. And what, what, what is it in Chinese? It's peanuts. Peanuts. <laughs> the peanuts comic strip. Uh, so some of these things are dictionaries, some of them are textbooks, some of them are bilingual, some, one of them is a tourist guide. And these are the kinds of things that you'd want to give students to send them out into the world of being able to buy baguettes in Paris. So, um, if you open your little brochure things. Right. We, have, uh, we have two things here. On the top there is the difference between open source and academia. And for those of you on video, that is a big straight line on the top and a squiggly line on the bottom. And for those of you who don't have brochures, raise your hand and I'll come give you in. Okay. So, so this is our challenge, right? We have this very big messy world of open source where people know what they want to work on generally open source communities. If you ask someone and you say, well, what are you making? Are they making, they're making, they're trying to make their application boot faster, or they're trying to improve the user interface, or they're trying to translate something into Swahili. They know what they're doing, but they don't necessarily know how long it's going to take to get there sometimes, or what they're going to be doing along the way. In contrast, in contrast, how many of you, when you entered college, knew approximately on what date you'd graduate? College, high school, uh, most people knew that, you know, two years, four years, however long it was, probably going to graduate 2011 or, okay. Uh, how many of you knew exactly what you were going to do once you did graduate? One person. I would like to know the secret to that. Uh, I was the ROTC, I didn't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and so that's one of the main challenges between buffering open source and academic communities, because in academia, you don't necessarily know where you're going to end up, but you have this pathway you're going to use to get wherever. And whereas in open source communities, you have an end goal. You're not sure which route you're going to take. And so how do we blend the two and come up with a process to get somewhere in an open source community?